Here we are with our Sunday School lesson for the second Sunday in Lent. And it's the final lesson in our winter quarterly. Next Sunday we will begin a new quarterly for spring and obviously we'll be continuing our Lenten journey as we, we travel toward the cross and the resurrection and celebrate Easter Sunday. This lesson today is uh, titled Prayer in Troubled Times. As I say, this finishes up this four-week series of prayer and the focal passage will be from John 12, 20 through 36. And the purpose statement, and this is interesting, it's interesting to reflect on this because it's something I guess I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but in another sense I do think about it every day. The purpose statement is to learn from Jesus' glorification in his time of trouble. And, and there's some interesting things to, to reflect on here. One of the things that I started thinking about as I was preparing this lesson are the number of, of sayings, the number of inscriptions, and many of you in your homes, you have different things. Many people I know have a sign up that says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, which is a passage from Joshua. And I've laughed before. I said, you know, my wife Judy bought a little plaque for me that's on my desk at home, and all it says is, I saw that, sign God. And, and we can all remember years ago we, when we wore the WWJD bracelets, and the idea was that every day we'd look at those WWJD bracelets and how can I be more like Jesus? And, and I, I think as I reflect on this lesson today that that's something that, that clearly comes out of this lesson, that we do desire to be more like Jesus. We want to know Jesus. But then we start thinking about it and we think, well, what are we doing to, to, to actually accomplish that? And so in an attempt to, to keep Jesus in the forefront, we do try to do little things, that, that say little sayings, little, little things that we have as reminders. But ultimately, all teaching, all preaching is about, is trying in some way to help those who are listening to believe deeper and have a better understanding of Jesus. Every Sunday school lesson taught ought to enable people to see Jesus more clearly and to understand him better. And I always reflect back when I've completed a Sunday school lesson, I've paid time in preparation, I've thought about it, and I always reflect back and I just, I hope that I've shared something that's a benefit. Because when I, when I think about that, I think, how can it help me grow? How can this study, how can this particular lesson help me understand Jesus even better? I love the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and many of you know that. It's found in Luke 19. Jesus came to Jericho, which was Zacchaeus' hometown, and the streets became crowded with people, and they wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Now, Zacchaeus, as we know, we know the little rhyme, was a short man, and he could not see Jesus over the crowd, so he ran ahead of the parade, and he climbed a tree so that he could see Jesus. And when Jesus reached that spot and saw Zacchaeus up in the tree, he invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, and before the day was over, Zacchaeus became a believer. So the question that I ask myself, the question that I want to ask you as we reflect on this lesson today, is how badly do I, how badly do you want to see Jesus? And what are we willing to do? What effort are we going to go through to try to get a better look at Jesus? In our lesson today from John 12, we hear about a group that wanted to see Jesus. And so I'm going to read from, from my Wesley Study Bible that I've referred to often. And I'm going to start out in John 12 and start at verse 20 and read through verse 36. Some Greeks were among those who had come up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and made a request. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The time has come for the human one to be glorified. I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. Whoever serves me must follow me. Wherever I am, there my servant will also be. My Father will honor whoever serves me. Now I am deeply troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this time? No, for this is the reason I have come to this time. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard and said, It's thunder. Others said an angel spoke to him. 
Jesus replied, This voice wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler will be thrown out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. He said this to show how he was going to die. The crowd responded, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the human one must be lifted up? Who is this human one? Jesus replied, The light is with you for only a little while. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness don't know where they are going. As long as you have the light, believe in the light, so that you might become people whose lives are determined by the light. After Jesus said these things, he went away and hid from them. So think about that. Reflect on that just for a few seconds. Jesus was in Jerusalem. He would already raised Lazarus from the dead, and he had made the triumphal entry. It was a week of Passover, the final week of his life. And our lesson tells us that some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the feast. Now these Greeks, they were either Gentile, converts to Judaism, or Jews who lived elsewhere. But they came to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple and participate in the Passover. And they'd heard marvelous things about Jesus. And they wanted to see him for themselves. They had heard about him, they wanted to see him. So they approached Philip. And he was one of Jesus' disciples. And, and they said, we'd like to see Jesus. Now, whether they actually got to meet Jesus or not, we don't know. What we do know is Philip told Andrew about their request, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus' response to the request was to give a little speech. And in that speech, he talked about his imminent death, and that when he was lifted up from the earth, he would draw all men, all men, to himself. So we clearly see that Jesus was interested in all people, Jews and Gentiles. And when Jesus had finished speaking, he left and he hid himself. So i got to ask myself this question. And I, and I say, ask it of yourself. How much do I really know about Jesus? I teach Sunday school. I've, I've, I've read the Bible. I've read the Bible for years. I've taught Sunday school lessons for decades. But how much do I really know about Jesus? I often say that the Bible is such an adult book because depending upon our circumstances, we read things differently. Have we seen Jesus? Not in the flesh. But I do have a desire, and the more I read, the more I study, the more I, I spend time in these, these lessons and reading Scripture, I want to know more clearly and completely about Jesus. Unlike Zacchaeus or this group of Greeks, we can't climb a tree to see him better. We can't go to where Jesus is staying and have a little chat with him. And so it clearly gets us a little bit of a disadvantage. So who really is Jesus? What did he look like? What did he act like? What did he really say? And there have been people, they've tried to say that Jesus never really existed, and I can't even imagine thinking about that for a second. I see billboards that said there's evidence for God, there's evidence for Jesus. There's evidence everywhere for Jesus. There is so much evidence that Jesus really existed, it's almost laughable to say otherwise. Isn't it amazing, and I don't know if you've thought about this or not, isn't it amazing that the birth of Jesus was so important that it split history into two parts, before Christ and after Christ? I think it's ironic that, that there are people that, that may not profess their faith, they may not come to church, they may not, but they use Jesus' name when they curse. Now, isn't that a silly thing to think about? How strange it would be to hear someone who hit their thumb with a hammer cry out, Dolly Madison! And yet, for some reason, Jesus is there in their mind. Even if they're using Jesus' name in vain, they're thinking about Jesus. Artists have given us so many pictures of Jesus. Scholars have written so much about Jesus. And can we believe with all that's written about Jesus that it's all false? No, it can't be. Some would lead you to believe that Jesus was nothing more than a political revolutionary. Otherwise, uh, others would have you believe that he was a magician, maybe a faith healer, that he was a cult leader. As you know, many movies have been written about and, and had things said about Jesus and Christianity. Some are false. Some are just way off the mark. So it creates a lot of confusion, and I think, there, I think it, it's... It's evil. I think it's Satan working to try to create those questions in our mind. 
So we need, as people of faith, to constantly be asking ourselves, who was Jesus? And then have a way, have a, have a reason to answer that question. I think, first of all, we start by returning to the Gospels. The, the Gospel writers had so much to say about Jesus. After all, look at it. It was first-hand knowledge for them. It was first-hand knowledge, and we know it was first-hand knowledge because as we, we delve, as we spend time in, in the Gospels, we, we see them questioning. We see them having the same questions that we would have, very human questions. I mean, who is this man? We just saw him heal somebody. We just see the way he relates to children and to, and to people. How he goes out of his way to, to acknowledge other people and attend to their needs. How he's such a servant and yet he's the master. And it, they were questioned. It, they baffled him. I believe that the more we study Jesus, the more we want to study him. Jesus simply can't be explained. He can't be pigeonholed. As one person said, if Jesus had never lived, we would have never been able to invent him. I think that's an interesting thing to say. You can't make this stuff up. The two words that we can never think of applying to Jesus are boring and predictable. Many have tried to present Jesus as just a nice man who told people to be nice. But one wonders how telling people to be nice could get a man crucified. Can you imagine a government executing Mr. Rogers? Jesus was such a contradiction in so many ways. He was religious. He was truly holy. Yet he favored those who would have been kicked out of most churches. He was a prince of peace. <clears throat> but those in authority, whether religious or political, regarded him as a troublemaker and a disturber of the peace. He was the king of kings. <clears throat> Yet he avoided all the traditional measures of success, wealth, property, fame, and family. One of the things that has challenged us over the years about Jesus is trying to strike the balance between the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. Which is it? Was he human or was he divine? We clearly can say he was both. He was just like everyone else. And at the same time, he was very, very different. Both realities give us incredible comfort. <coughs> We need him to be like us so we can relate to him and trust that he can relate to us. But we also need him to be so much more and better than us so that he can be the perfect Lamb of God. So now I think you're beginning to understand why we have so much work to do to understand Jesus. It's demanding, it's challenging, but it's clearly essential. And I think there's four reasons why it is so essential. The first is, to essential, is essential to see Jesus clearly because Jesus reveals the Father. Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, and we all want to know God. We know him best through Jesus. If we don't come to know Jesus clearly and correctly, then we really don't know God. Second, it is essential to see Jesus clearly because Jesus is the Savior. There is no other way to God except through Jesus. If there are other ways to God, then it was not necessary for Jesus to come and die for us. But since there is no other way, then we must know Jesus and put our trust in Him. Third, it is essential to see Jesus clearly because we must walk as Jesus did. John wrote, whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. Let that sink in a second. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. As Jesus' followers, we must walk as he did. We must follow his example. We must be like our teacher and therefore be fully trained. And finally, it is essential to see Jesus clearly because that's what sustains us. That's what gets us through every day, every week, every month. That's what help, helps us deal so much with all of the stuff that we talk about, all the stuff that gets in the way. Keeping our eyes on Jesus and understanding his mission and his suffering will give us the endurance we need to carry through. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus did the will of God with joy in his heart because he knew what the blessed outcome would be. And so I encourage you, my friends, I, I, I pray this for myself every single day, not to get tired, not to lose heart, not to get discouraged. When things seem like they're just more than we can handle, 
keep our eye on God. Keep our faith in the Lord. Let us see Jesus clearly and keep our eyes fixed on him and he will sustain us. I truly believe that no one who seriously takes a look at Jesus ever stays the same because Jesus changes lives. He's changing them every day, every minute. It's an ongoing process. It's something that we can't just pick up a Bible and, and read a Sunday school lesson on Sunday and then walk away and say, okay, I'm good until next week. It's something we talk about this often, that we, we, we immerse ourselves every day in Scripture. We read, we reflect. Sometimes it's just taking a passage and reading it and sitting back and thinking about it. Thinking about it all day long. Thinking about it as, as something important. I think about one of my grandchildren is, is going to a kindergarten that is a, a Christian-based kindergarten program, and he gets a Bible verse at chapel every week. And he's supposed to memorize that, that Bible verse. He's supposed to share it with his parents when he goes home. What a wonderful thing that is. What if we just did that? What if we picked one passage each week and said, that's going to be my passage for this week? And then devote ourselves more completely to it. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for this lesson. It's, it's not a complicated lesson, but yet it's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson because it requires so much of us. We do want to know you. We want to understand you. We, we want to know what your expectations are of us. And then we need the encouragement. We need the support that you give us to go out and do those things you want us to do. We ask each week, we ask that you keep our eyes open to the things you want us to see, our ears open to the things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with that love that you have put in each and every one of us. And constantly reminding us that no, much, no matter how much we give away, you're going to give us more to give. And we're to share it with everyone because we're to love you first and love each other second. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends. I hope you have a terrific week, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon.